Welcome, everyone. Um, welcome to our fabulous five editors. Um, I'm full of nervous, nervous excitement. <laughs> the only equivalent, I think, would be, um, I don't know if you ever saw Mrs. Doyle and Father Ted when she had the, the three bishops. This is the, this is the equivalent. I've got I've got five great editors here from with five great shows. So I'm both nervous and excited um, for, for what happens for the next. I, I would like to say maybe hour, hour and a quarter. Um, the way these events normally go is that um, we talk about we talk about the work and we talk about yourselves and um, which and the time tends to go very very quickly. Especially normally these are one on one. So with five of you, it'll it will be go doubly fast or a multiple of that. So um, and at the end we like to open things up for questions. So there's quite a few people on the call. So if you have questions, try not to save them up for the last minute because it can then tend to leave a tail on the um on the timings for the event. So just feed your questions, please, into the chat and um, we'll hopefully pick up on them. Um, so I want to say welcome to, to our five guests. I want to say welcome to our friends from ACE. I want to say welcome to our friends from Irish Screen Editors and I want to say welcome to everyone from British Film Editors and also welcome to non-British Film Editor members who've come along this evening. Um, there's one reminder I want to give you all. This is part of the, the inaugural BFE Cut Above Awards. And um, so hopefully this will give you an insight into what went on beyond the, the films that you've watched and, um, and may help you in your decision making towards, towards your votes. And um, just to remind you that if, in order to vote, you need to log on to the, the, the BFE website, go to the awards page and click on the vote. And um, just make sure you vote just the once. Um, and um, that's pretty much it, I think. Um, so plenty of questions and um, we'll, tr we'll try to keep this, as I said, to, to just over an hour. Um, and um, the way I want, I, I'd like this to, to, to flow out is, as, as basically like a chat among friends. Um, they're very, very interesting pieces of work, all of these. Um, they're, they've got so many common themes and then so much different about them. And I've, I've for, I had the, the good fortune to have seen four of them all the way through, but I hadn't seen the fifth, which was the Ted Bundy um, falling for a killer. So I binged Ted Bundy last week over, over two nights. And then since then, I've watched um, one episode from each of your um, series. And so just as a reminder of it, and it was quite interesting um, going through the experience of re-watching them. And I, I'd really like to touch on that when we're, when we're talking today, because it, it, it really felt like um, there was a very, very particular viewing experience and a very particular message you were left with after watching each of these series. And I'd be curious to know how you guys got to where you got to with, with that in mind in terms of tonally and the resonance that it had and what it says about us socially. Because it, 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 it feels like they're about, um, the films are seem to be, talk a lot about society and how, what we value in society and, and who's important and who's not important. Um, and um, these are really big questions. And um, each of the films in their own way seems to have touched upon those themes. And they kind of, they, they kind of pair up as well, the films, um, the, the series, I felt. You, you've got Iraq and Murdoch that have got this kind of a link, a causal, causality between them. And then you've got Epstein and Bundy, these horrible, horrible men. And what was going on socially with them and um, and how that story was told because the Bundy story has been told many times, but it hasn't been told like this. And um, and then you've got Tiger King, which, you know, on the face of it, it's, it seems like it's, some, it's, an, it's an outlier, but it seems to say so much about um, society and, and the richness of, of a layered and free society, but the craziness 
of a society with certain values and certain priorities. And I, and I, and it, it had the most astounding impact, it seemed, um, in the last 12 months during lockdown. And um, which I don't know whether as filmmakers you felt it was, it was going to go there. And I wonder whether it became something different um, by the, by the time it was out there and had a life of its own. Because when I went back to look at Tiger King again, I saw that there was a new episode that had, that had been made because of how successful it had been. And um, I didn't actually watch the episode. I didn't have the time. So, but I went back and I watched, um, I watched episode two. And it's just, it's, it's unreal how much you guys packed into that, um, into those episodes. Um, like I found myself wanting to see more of, um, of um, our friend, who's the chap with the hat? Um, okay. exotic Joe, Joe Exotic. Exotic Joe. Uh, Joe Exotic, yeah. Joe Exotic, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, his music video, I was just leaning forward and I wanted to know more, you know? Um, so I, I think maybe it would be it would be great if you could kick us off, Dylan, and just yeah, just tell us what did what was Tiger King for you when you first came to it? How was it sold to you as as a project? Um, and when you were in it, were you aware of what you had? And what's your and what's your take on it now? Yeah, well, I actually first became aware of the project in 2016. Doug, my colleague, was the, sort of taking the helms as the lead editor on it at that point, and it was being pitched as a completely different series, just about the world of big cat ownership. And I worked on a little bit of a sizzle reel, and I hadn't—I I knew they had something there just because Joe Exotic and Carol Baskin were so compelling. But then I didn't really think about it for a few years, and um, suddenly I saw Joe Exotic had been arrested for trying to hire a hitman. So I reached back out to. Uh, Rebecca, the director of the project, and we ran into each other at Sundance and she said, well, we're turning the material into something completely different. Um, it's a series now and would you like to come back on board? So I think the most exciting thing about the structure and arc of the series is we really tried to mirror the director's relationship with the footage. So the first episode, you're just introduced to this very compelling subculture. And as we go, the layers and layers get peeled back. And we really wanted to give viewers that same experience because it's just such an enticing world that you suddenly start to see all this subculture, um, darker underbelly stuff going on. Yeah, yeah. and I felt kind of, it's, it, I, I don't know, is, is it c c correct to use the term freak pointing, but it, it, it felt like that sort of enjoyment I was getting from it because it's such a spectacle, the whole thing. And, um, and eventually you're kind of complicit in it all, but, Underneath, it's like it's this horrendous power imbalance that's there, isn't it, between these these big cat owners and these other well-meaning individuals that are part of their whole world, and of course, then the animals themselves. And yeah, yeah. and you single that episode too, which is one of the ones I spent the most time on, where we really tried to hone in on just that parallel between um, the way they treat their animals and the way they treat their staff. It's so predatory on every single level, and um, it, that parallel is just really endlessly fascinating to me. Thank you. Um, so moving on from, um, from Tiger King, I'd love to talk about Ted Bundy and Falling for a Killer. Um, so that, that was the one that I, I, I binged over two nights last week. And um, um, it's a very different watch to Tiger King in terms of um, how it draws you in and um, pulls you through and um, as a viewer and and binging is it, it's such an, an interesting way of um, consuming work nowadays but strangely I find I can binge the um, the murderous stuff but some of the others uh, I'll, I'll get to it later but some of it is less less bingy shall we say um, uh, because it's just difficult but what I found with your film, um, I knew something about Ted Bundy, but I had no idea what a, what a mess socially the 70s were um, and how the story of Ted Bundy is the story of women's rights and the lack of rights and the lack of voice and the lack of equality. Um, and I'm curious about, Thematically, was that what drew you to this? How aware were you of that and um, how much it influenced the edit? Um, 
Yeah, I, that's like what really interested me about coming on to the project. When I first met with the director, Trish Wood, uh, her vision for it was she was really inspired by OJ, Made in America, and how they look at his life and career and the crimes he committed and uh, like the LA riots and everything was just through the lens of race. So she wanted to sort of apply that treatment to the Ted Bundy story, but through the lens of gender. So it was really about giving voice to the victims. And of course we have his longtime girlfriend in it who had never spoken, her daughter. Um, so yeah, it was really just a, a chance to try to look at the 70s in, in the midst of you know the feminist, burgeoning feminist movement at the time and it'd be happening for a while, but it was peaking kind of in the 70s. Um, so that was the, that was the intention with that was to look at it through gender. Okay. And, and I'm not familiar with, I haven't had the chance to see your work so much as I wouldn't know the work of Anna and Sam. Hmm. And would that be typically the type of project you, you would have been drawn to yourself, Steve? Yeah, I mean, I love documentaries. Uh, most of my career has been in documentary. Um, I did, I did another series called Hip Hop Evolution, which there was four seasons of, which looked at the, the history of hip hop uh, from a, with a cultural lens as well. Uh, so archive shows are kind of my, what I've been doing for the last few years, archive and interview kind of heavy shows. Um, yeah, so it, yeah, it was like, a, another thing I'd like to say about the director and the editing and it was, she for, was very clear from the, outset she did not want fast paced cuts and you know the the serial killer trope that you're trying to scare the audience and mm -hmm. she wanted it very drawn out and slow paced and you know string instruments playing and and just kind of to to really get into the the victim's mindset so um yeah that was just another thing i wanted to add about that but yeah in terms of my career um that's what I've been doing for the last couple of years is kind of these big archive heavy series. I mean, it's phenomenal. The, um, the interview with um, Bundy's former partner, I, I don't remember her name. Liz. Yeah. It's, it's incredible that how giving she was and generous she was with, with yeah. her story. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Oh, sorry, I thought I interrupted you. So, um, Maria, um, Epstein then. Wow. <clears throat> <laughs> it, well, it, 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 it felt like they're, they're almost bedfellows in a way in terms of um, your film. The, the series brings us to a point in very, very recent history. And um, it just shows that the, the, the failure of the the system to protect the women mm -hmm. um it's, it, it's it's an outrageous film in that way um it, it's very difficult to watch because um it was, it was such an outrage and i got i got the sense that you were alluding to the fact that there were more individuals colluding with epstein than you were able to actually um show to us um and yeah yeah it's um It's it, it, it just it, it, it's a very hard watch for that very reason that, um, you know, um, as, as far as we may have, it was kind of, Bundy was almost com comforting to see because that was the 70s. Mm -hmm. And whereas what you've got are these people that I kind of um, would have seen as been our, our social, social, what would you call them, guides? Yes. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and yeah. and actually, it's it's pretty rotten. It's a yeah. pretty rotten, pretty rotten institutionalized type of um, type of thing that was just going on and and condoned and and facilitated. And, mm. Yeah, and I can speak to that too. I mean, what I had said before that it was a difficult process, and um, you know, what really wound up. I mean, I was brought on to uh, the show before Jeffrey had even be, been arrested actually in, in New York. So the sort of curious and, you know, different outstanding thing about this edit was that we were really cutting breaking news. 
Um, it wasn't, you know, a documentary that we had a load, uh, you know, a, a whole load of archival or um, even information about. We were getting our information as it was breaking. And so uh, there was a lot of editing and pulling things apart and re-editing. And um, I think it was really unique to our process. I mean, I personally have, other than, you know, write journalism where you have someone on the ground and you're getting things in, but you more or less know the storyline, had never been in a situation where we had, you know, we had Netflix on board and we had a show to make, but the ground was being pulled out from underneath us every day. Um, and of course he was also an extremely private person. And I think that a lot of people who were involved in, you know, the sort of behavior and a lot of people who are involved in that type of you know, in that elite world also were very private. So getting the archival was extremely difficult for us. Um, knowing what we were gonna walk into work to the next day was always a mystery. And um, yeah, so that was, that was a really unique challenge. And that's why I think like I talk a lot about how important it was for us to all be such a close knit team because I would, I mean, I would honestly say that I don't think I've ever relied on my team and quite quite such a way before you know we had to be very um loose and very collaborative I mean you know you could spend a week cutting something and then realize that it actually because something else had just happened you know you need to kind of disassemble that and you might have to throw it to the next guy and say I got to work on something else right now so yeah that was that was really unique to add it and and of course you know it was a lot like it was a lot to it was a lot as far as the process was concerned to come at something with an idea of a narrative and then have to sort of re-familiarize yourself with how you were going to approach it the next day. But, but from what you said there, Maria, so did the um, did the narrative shift in a way? Like, so th there was there was a bulwark protecting Epstein and preventing you from accessing certain things and probably legal threats, et cetera. Did all that shift during, I mean, was it a six, 12, 18 month edit period? What, what are we talking about? Okay, so we, okay, so I was, hired, I was hired because of the nature of the show, right? It's like such an interesting sort of process to dissect, but because um, I was again hired before he was arrested in New York. So, you know, we actually wound up going on a, a pretty, a month long, I think, break because we just, there was no sense in trying to A, tell the story while it was really in the, at the acute moment of unfolding. And then B, um, a lot of the women, most of the women actually were reluctant to speak with us, if not straight out said no before he was arrested. And then once he was in custody, we were able to get interviews that we were not able to get before because because these women were very scared mm. and so that was that wow. was really interesting to I mean you know uh to also be a part of to feel like okay well what do we have you know we have this one person who's willing to tell her story and then as soon as he was in custody and then of course as soon as he was dead we had women really coming out of the woodwork to to be to tell their stories and that was pretty profound so it's kind of um a bit like this tonight, it's kind of nerve wracking and exhilarating. Yes. <laughs> yeah, 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 it was. It was, yeah, a really unique yeah. process in that way. Yeah, yeah, yeah amazing. Um, yeah. And I'm going to move on to you next, Anna, if that's okay. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure if you had the toughest job of them all. I think Maria and Anna, there's. I found both of your films most difficult to watch, um, mm -hmm. both of your series. And I, I, with Iraq, I couldn't, I couldn't watch them one by one, um, just because they're, it's so emotive and so um, difficult and harrowing, I think. Um, and I found, when I went back to, I went back to Fallujah was the one that I rewatched um, yesterday. And um, it's, <sighs> It's, there's a certain spell that you all weave as editors or we all weave. And so it was hard to watch. I was trying to watch it objectively and try and pick it apart and have questions to ask. And there are some details that I'm interested in, but, but it's impossible to resist being sucked into it because it's such, um, it's such a powerful um, story and an emotive story. Um, 
and it triggers triggers all those all those feelings all over again. And um, I wondered for you how 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 knowingly were you um, doing that to us all? <laughs> <laughs> well, manipulating you all. <laughs> you were very very restrained with your use of music as it went along, uh, and then we just hit a point where we go into the minaret. And the tension, the tension is there, you know, and oh God, something's going to happen, something's going to happen, something's going to happen. And even though I'd seen it a couple of times before, you know, I was on tender hooks again and, and, and then equally just feeling very, very nervous on behalf of um, the young boy, the two-year-old boy and his mom and feeling heartbroken and, and feeling already, spoiler alert, you know, that something absolutely calamitous had happened to him. Um, and so um, I, I actually I won't go into the details, but um, it just it, it, it really gra your film grabs you and picks you up and puts you back down again. Um, I, I felt. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, how much? Yeah. How much is that? Did, did you have to calibrate that yourself? I mean, um, well, this? interestingly, the minaret, that minaret sequence was the first sequence I cut because I knew how I was going to do it. And, and that's how I tend to cut. I. I I tend to cut things in blocks if I can. And um, so after watching all the interviews, I mean, we were quite lucky with Iraq in that it obviously was historical. So it's very different to Maria's. So it happened. And most of the interviews had been done by the time I got to the edit, but not all of them. Um, and so I knew I had certain things. And then I have to say, I know she's here, but our amazing, amazing archive researcher, Miriam Walsh, um, was so integral. I mean, the whole team was incredible anyway, but she was very integral to helping me with the story. And we, she'd found by complete coincidence, this archive that matched that story because there wasn't any illustration apart from the photographer's photographs. But by complete chance, this unit that was a parallel unit, British army unit with this amazing camera person, cameraman had filmed that event, but kind of in parallel. So we had this wow. footage, wow. <laughs> so there was this sort of perfect storm. But then we got that story and then the little boy came way, way, way later. And, and Miriam and I, and actually our producer, Joe, we kept saying, we need to have more Iraqi stories because it's about Iraq. It's not just about American soldiers. And so that element of the story took quite a long time. And again, we didn't really have the footage. We had this one tiny clip of the boy in hospital. So everything else had to sort of be constructed. But, but when I was making, constructing that episode, I mean, I did do some work on sort of working out how this could, contrapuntally work how this this story could work against this one and how I could intercut them and sometimes mm -hmm. that was just story and sometimes it's image you know I, I think it, sometimes it's just a powerful image juxtaposed like I know one cut I just cut the two mothers next to each other and just even seeing how physically different they were that that sort of gives an impact yeah so yeah, yeah I mean I, I suppose I, I tend to cut with my gut <laughs> <laughs> You know, I, I I wasn't, but I wasn't consciously trying to manipulate. It wasn't cynical. I was just, it, I suppose I felt like you, you know, I'm very close to the material. So I, I, I and it's harrowing. So you, so you feel that, that, that absolute. Um, yeah, but you, you knew we were going to go to a dark place mm -hmm. with this episode. I mean, that was, that was agreed from the out, out, outset, mm -hmm. I suppose. And so then part of your job as the editor is well how dark do we go here with this how how do i how do i balance this with light and shade and that's what i wondered because um you know it was it's it's a tough it was a, it's a tough watch um but um well the characters i was totally well. blessed with ashley the photographer and dexter the american and, and they were just they gave me they had humor you know they had this amazing detachment that journalists sometimes have they can laugh at themselves and so even in the midst of tragedy, um, there's something light, there's something funny, there's, there's something sort of redemptive about it. And I think that's what, that's what I always knew was going to have to exist alongside the, the horror. Because you can't, you just can't be, you can't go in that tunnel for, for you know, six yeah. minutes. Yeah. And uh, I, Ashley, the photographer, he, he said, 
he mentioned something about having taken two and a half thousand photographs that week. Did you have access to all of those photographs or, or what was the story there? We had access to a lot of them, but again, um, the team did an incredible job at pruning the, the best ones. And I had access to some of the books and um, some of them were in sequence, which was great. And he was very, very generous about uh, giving us free reign initially to, to anything we wanted. So um, yeah, there weren't two and a half thousand, but there were a lot and I had great APs and I mean, really brilliant. Again, the team was just, I, I can't know, Maria said she relied on her team, but I, there's so many people that made my job easier <laughs> and yeah. who were just brilliant and bright and had good judgment. And, you know, I, I, I couldn't have done it without them. Okay, thanks, Anna. Mm. And so, um, uh, lastly, on to Sam, I can't see you on my screen. Oh, you're yeah. there you are. Hi, Sam. Um, Hi, man. So, yeah, so the, the rise of the Murdoch dynasty, congratulations on that. Um, yeah. What, so so I, I, there's not, everybody knows Rupert Mur Murdoch and uh, um, I, I guess are familiar with him. I hope people here have seen, I've seen the series. Um, it's it's the most it's the easiest I guess that and Tiger King, but um, it, it it sort of it has a it has a flow a very steady flow um, like a like a movie I think <laughs> um, I haven't I haven't seen Succession but I get the sense that perhaps yeah. it, was, it was it was aping that um, yeah. I just wondered how you came to the project and um, what drew you to it and. Um, how you approach the edit, you, because for you, this was, I mean, it was almost complete, pretty much 100% archive, is that correct? No, no master interviews? I, I, we did We did have, um, um, thank you, Fagan, for having us. Um, we, did, we did have um, our series director, Jamie Roberts, had an amazing, he, I mean, when I, when I arrived in the edit, uh, he sort of, um, the, the cast, I mean, cast, the, the people he had interviewed, were just, and he was still interviewing them. He did sort of interview tons of people who were, who, who were part of the, of, of the stories, you know? And um, uh, I guess in answer to your question, the reason I, I had been working for the production company 72 Films for almost two years. And, and my time with them was, my, my time, my two year collaboration was coming to an end. And, and this was the last thing and, and I, and I knew quite a bit about Rupert Murdoch. I'm, I'm from Spain in the Canary Islands, small island, Tenerife. And I moved here in 94. And so I lived, as a very young person, I lived the, the 1996 election, 1997 election where Tony Blair and, um, and I was really attracted to that story because I kind of had seen the power of tabloid media, which was a little bit alien to me. Um, and then, and, and I had seen how much power it had and then, and so that that attracted me to to the story, and and I had worked with seventy two films doing very heavily archive based films, also inspired by OJ Made in America. And um, I hadn't watched Succession when I started the edit, and I kind of wish I hadn't. I had I did because then I watched it as I was starting to cut the series and and cut episode one, and and I um and I kind of wish I hadn't because it's sort of forced me in a, in a, the music sort of, the music choices were sort of very much defined by the music I listened to in succession, which perhaps with hindsight was a bit of a mistake. Um, I also would like to say that I, Justin uh, Badger is here, um, who um, was, hey, Justin. I, we would both um, work together on apps one and three, but, but I mean, um, Justin was the sort of the pillar of the series because um, I left in, December, late December, um, 2019, and um, no films have been locked. And um, and so he he locked all three of them. Um, so really he's, he's, he, he should be doing the talking, <laughs> not me. <laughs> no way, no way. Um, but but um, it's really interesting. Um, the, what, what's really, you know, our executive producer, uh, David Glover, who's a, a force of nature in many more ways than one, um, um, he what what he tends to do with these archive-led films is he tends to sort of focus in creating present tense narrative, 
Although what you're watching is something that happened in 1996. And you also, in, in, in the case of episode one, you have to rewind a bit further because you need to sort of explore the relationship between Rupert Murdoch and Margaret Thatcher, a bit of his childhood, etc. But what he try, tries to impose is just present tense narrative within one episode. Uh, and so, so episode one is very much focused on Tony Blair becoming prime minister and how his relationship with, with Rupert f- could perhaps have helped him. Episode two is about the phone hacking scandal and, he's, and how it brings Murdoch's empire to its knees and then the rise again, you know, um, which is basically focusing on the Brexit referendum and the election of Donald Trump. Mm-hmm. Um, so he focuses on those kind of things and, and that allows you to sort of create momentum in what essentially is a, a past tense story. And so that makes it quite interesting, I think, uh, as an editor, because you are create, you are sort of forcing them a, a drama-like narrative to essentially a, a documentary. Um, yes. And an archive-led documentary. I mean, what's really interesting about Rupert Murdoch is that he's this sort of kind of, in, in, in similar ways as, 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 as he sort of, de- he defines these sort of, a, a breed of CEOs, very wealthy, powerful CEOs, who believe that there is a rule for them. And I think Epstein is the same. And so I, so I was wondering, there's yeah. a rule for them and then a rule for others. So, so this idea that Rupert Murdoch is a man who is anti-establishment, who is not pro-establishment, he hates establishment. And yet, you know, he went to a boarding school where, in Australia where Prince Charles went. And he went to Oxford University and he's very, very wealthy and was born with a silver spoon and he's hell bent in doing things his way. So to an extent, he's a very impressive figure, but he's he sort of manipulates the truth to his own liking. And, you know, we know now from from speaking to Jamie Roberts, who's still sort of keeping the, the series director, who's still keeping his ear to the ground that. I think last week he was meeting Boris Johnson, and I think he's he's been he's he's very much trying to get his own twenty four hour channels, which would be in the shape of Fox News. He's always been against. Um, we have an agency here, here called Ofcom, uh, which Ruben Murdoch hates. So I think he's slowly but surely putting people in Ofcom to destroy it, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So. Uh, it's really interesting. It's it's that he I I think what's interesting is that he he just he's happy to look the other way when people are doing nasty things, but very happy to also sort of pull the trigger with his news outlet to let you know what's wrong, you know. And and yeah. so it's it's really interesting. I I before working on the documentary, I did not know how much he had met with Tony Blair. Um, I had witnessed the election of Tony Blair as a honeymoon period in this country. And I did see some really, as a foreigner, I saw so much positive change. And then working on the um, on the sort of election night was, I tried to cut it like a tragedy. And, and, and like you and I work in blocks. So I cut that election night separately. And so, and I wanted to make you feel like it was tragic because this sort of, perhaps the deals that he cut with Tony Blair we're not good for any of us. Who knows? <laughs> yeah, and also the the lineage with um, Brexit and, and yeah. where Murdoch stood on Europe as well. And I hadn't realised that um, that Tony Blair had promised a referendum on the on the euro. Yeah, neither did I. Neither did I. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. It's, a, it's a fascinating stuff because I actually rewatched. That's the one I rewatched today. Um, okay. So to actually, so bringing that on, um, Dylan, talking about people who don't accept the status quo and, and, and they want to create rules for themselves. I mean, that was the, the shocking thing watching the second film in your series today is, is all these, these guys, well, and Carol Baskin, of course, um, that have created these worlds for themselves. Um, and um, yeah, it was, it, it, your, your films, were amazing because I think people, it's just how many times can your jaw hit the ground when you're watching something on telly? I mean, it, it, the start of it is there's been there's there's been um, a mauling at, at the um, at the sanctuary or at, at the um, the place that they all are. I don't know what it's called. And next thing is we see we see the 
a camera that they're dragging her out and blurring her her bloodied arm and um it was just it, it was unreal um the i suppose the intensity or the richness of the material that you had if you like um i wonder can you talk about the stuff that you left out what were the what were the challenges you had to overcome what are you proud of that none nobody else might know about um that took place what are what are your abiding memories i don't know it'd be nice just to talk maybe if you keep yourselves unmuted and join in um just to talk about memories of the of 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 your edits and um, things things that you you've achieved or that you had to achieve when you were doing them. Well, I I would say one of the biggest challenges was the amount of archive because in the way these people built their own kingdoms, they also built their own testament to themselves. And so Joe was yeah. filming every moment of every day of his life, and we really had hundreds and hundreds of hours of footage to wade through. Um, so that was definitely one of the hardest parts, but also a joy when our assistant would stumble upon something that was just totally unbelievable. Um, and it was very similar to Mar what Maria said about her process with um, just passing scenes back and forth. None of us were able to be really precious with any of our sequences because we were always getting a new hard drive of material mailed in or a new interview that would come in that would totally reshape our understanding of the material. Um, one of the moments that I feel like was the biggest shock for us as editors is uh, when we were close to locking picture, we just decided to go back to like the first two or three shoots that we had done with Joe Exotic. And we noticed that Joe was giving the, the filmmakers a tour of his house. And he said, this is my going to Tampa gun. And none of us really knew what that meant when we had first seen the clip because we didn't know too no. much about the feud with Carol Baskin at that point. But just revisiting that footage was such a like, an insight into how pathologically obsessed he was with going after this woman. And it um, it reshaped what a lot of us felt about how we saw Joe. So- and Did you have enough time for to work the material? Um, if you've got mountains and mountains, it, it must put an awful lot of pressure on you. Yeah, I mean, it was a lot of pressure and there's still a lot that just didn't make it in. Um, and I hope there's a way for, for people to see more of it someday, but- um, you know, we really just had to hone it down to the core story beats. And that was, it was a huge challenge because there was so much to wade through. Um, but we were always looking for those thematic connections between um, between our characters, like Joe's admiration of someone like Doc Antle. And he really modeled himself off of, off of what Doc was doing. Um, yeah, yeah. It, was just, it was always changing. I could see you nodding your head there, Maria. While, um... yeah. Well, I was getting jealous about all the archival. <laughs> um, you know, we had an amazing archival producer on our show too, Hillary McCone. And um, but there was there was um, it was like hair, it was like hair tearing how little archive we really had. I mean, um, these people were so private, and of course now you know why. You know, and uh, it, it was didn't, it didn't feel like that. I have to say, when I was watching it. Oh, well, that's great. <laughs> That is, um, that's great. That was our, that was our job. I feel like that was our biggest challenge. Um, I like the way you used all the aerial shots and brought me into this world. And, and I didn't know sometimes what was archived and what was filmed. So that's uh, great. That's great to hear. I mean, yeah. and I think like, you know, that was really our goal. Uh, we had to lean on all of that. And we had great DPs out on the, in the field and great producers out in the field. And of course that was also everything. I mean, it wasn't just the edit team that at the end of the project felt like my, you know, we would never have been able to do this without one, one another. It was our producers and our DPs and, um, so, so yeah, that was really our biggest challenge. That was, I, I would say, uh, was our lack of, of archival. We had a lot of people at the end of the day who were really willing to step in and tell us our stories and really wanted to take care of them as best as possible. Um, and I think our, le our legal hoops were a really big challenge as well. So much hit the cutting room floor on this one. And I think it was really painful for us as editors because Oh, and you had asked early on if our process was six months or 12 months or, and, you know, we had all signed up for something like a four month tops edit and we were all in the room for, God, I don't remember, Marion and James, if you want to chime in, I, I feel like it was 10 years, but it wasn't, it was, you know, it was probably eight to 10 months at the end. I, I was on the show for eight to 10 months. And um, yeah, so it was, yeah. it was a lot of having to really, um, you know, a lot of the people that were in Jeffrey's circuit um, 
are also highly connected and are also elites. And, you know, it was just the case that at the end of the day, we couldn't get them all in. But, you know, we're talking about people like uh, Harvey Weinstein and who I actually worked for um, way back in the day in the early 2000s. And it was just as you know painful and difficult as you can imagine. But, um, you know, luckily we were able to kind of you know, get a, get a little bit of that story in there, but we had some stories, you know, where, where Donald Trump was, was involved with, with some of the, you know, from Obama, yeah. even any sort of legal repercussions because of this Zoom, but, you know, it was, it was hard to lose all of that. We really felt a sense of responsibility towards what was happening globally in the moment, and we wanted to get it all in. So that was a really unique challenge. I found myself, um, doing research about Epstein after watching the series, because um, I don't know if it was a choice on your part not to talk too much about him and his, his, his history and focus more on the women and, you know, tell their stories. But um, yeah, I was just wondering how the hell did this guy go from being a, a relief teacher in, in the suburbs of New York or somewhere to yeah. being worth um, a billion and, um, I, yeah. I, I got a sense that maybe there was cameras in apartments had something to do with it and, and yeah. just good old fashioned blackmail or something. I don't know. Um, right. And whether there was a layer that you just couldn't go to in the story. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, in many ways there was. And I think especially just being on, you know, being inside of the story for so long, you all come up with your theories, right? Wow. <laughs> so there was a lot of, like, we all, I think, daily discussed, well, what do you think, you know, how do you think this happened? Or how do you think that happened? But, you know, as much as we, we I think that there are so, I think that there are a lot of stories in the story of what happened with Jeffrey Epstein. And I think at the end of the day, we really thought to focus on the women and the women's stories. And I think that that ultimately is what survived. And I'm so grateful for that. So, yeah. I agree. I agree. Um, so who have I left out here? Steve, we haven't spoken for a long time. <laughs> what about your experience of the, um, the Bundy edit? Well, I mean, one thing that I keep thinking about actually listening to Maria with Epstein, like Epstein was happening while we were in the edit suite. So and the Me Too movement had, had, you know, was in full swing. And so that was really informing how we approach the subject matter even more. I mean, the, the director had the idea, um, but just every, everything we did, every clip we chose was trying to, you know, mirror what was happening now and just showing you that it was happening in full force back then and it's continued to happen all the way through. So yeah, I mean that really the times today really shaped the lens that we look through back at it with, with the hindsight. Um, yeah. It was yeah. interesting. To, so today your film, Marie's film and, and Sam and Justin's film, um, there's a shot in the Murdoch uh, movie that shows one of his sons, Lachlan or Rupert Jr., I don't know what they're called, and he just has this jawline and he kind of looks like he's come, it's an Ivy League um, college white boy of privilege shot, shot. And it's just Bundy is Epstein. Is, yeah. well, I, don't, I don't want to put a slur yeah. on, um, on Murdoch's son, but. Um, yeah. 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 The people who don't um, live by our rules, something there's no, something with the, the, the entitled white guy. Um, yeah, he's he's the he's the epitome of the entitled white guy. He he was a you know a failing law student, and at the end when he was sentenced to the, to die, I mean, one of the judges said, you know, you would have made a real good lawyer, pal. Like he was he was being chummy with them, and like it's just unbelievable if this man had been a, a black man he, there's no way he would have gone on and, and done as much damage as he had done so i mean and yeah it's just it's, it is the epitome of the entitled white man oh, it's a yeah. sad story that was that, that was one of the jaw on the floor moments from your your series yeah it was, it was the, yeah that that, that, that judge, yeah, yeah. I, and also it's just heartbreaking um remind me of um of Ted Bundy's partner's name again, his his long-term uh, Liz, Liz Kendall. Yeah, where Liz 
Liz, where she goes to her dad and says, yeah. you know, the police aren't listening to me. You've got some friends in the police station. They yeah. listen to you. And he decided that he didn't want to lose Ted, clean cut Ted as a son-in-law. Yeah, exactly. was, Jeez. So she, I mean, every she went to the police multiple times, and they were like, "No, not Ted Bundy. Can't be him." Like, I mean, he every bit of evidence he called, like he called himself Ted to his victims. He, there was no, I mean, there was he was not a good criminal. So no. he did everything possible <laughs> to try to get caught, and yet he just went on unscathed, and because people just didn't see it, it was he was the invisible man, right? It was. Yeah, but chugging, chugging around the, the country in, in a VW, brown VW Beetle as well, you know. Yes, yeah. and um, leaving credit card receipts at every gas station. And I mean, it's it's, it's mind boggling how he yeah. got away with it for so long. It is a shocker. Um, yeah. Anna and um, Sam, do, do you guys want to join in here? Do you want to talk, share? But I, I mean, I, I'd like to say that, that you were talking about the sort of most rewarding moment for me was was to because you know when you leave an edit and it's not complete you feel slightly um anxious for a few weeks and my proud my my proudest moment just to see the amazing work justin did really when he went out on tv it's just i was so so proud of the series so that that was my i mean it was a really intense edit the 12 weeks i was on it um and um and we were getting interviews so constantly new interviews and new material and new archive and so it was quite intense um so um to see it go out was was, was a massive achievement <laughs> and to see so it, you, it, you, 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 it was very awesome. saying, you left you left justin with a bit of a mess did you <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> well i have to say it's it's one of the um it's the hard thing is to take over uh, it's a hard thing to give up an edit, I think. It's the, it's the yeah. worst thing in the world, actually, is when you leave yeah. for yeah. whatever reason and you've not finished it. It's absolutely horrific, I think. Yeah. But this time I certainly felt <clears throat> I just wanted to keep <laughs> what Sam and Will had done. I just, I mean, that scene you mentioned, Sam, about the election, Blair's election, that stood out to me. And I thought, OK, we're not touching this. You know, we're... You have all these pressures coming in from all the execs about rearranging the film and you're just trying to build a fence around things which in some ways you could think would sound quite precious but <laughs> you know if it's somebody else's work it's much easier to be more precious about it i think you know yeah i think i'd like i mean we used to have because iraq was so harrowing um we used to have like before we were working in this ridiculous office that was not really fit for purpose. The sound was leaking all over the place. It was too hot. But we used to, the editors used to get in a bit earlier than the rest of the team. And we used to have kind of editor's therapy time. <laughs> and like, sort of, it was really informal, but it was sort of 9.30 in the morning. And we used to sit and just chew the fat and sound off about, ah, oh, this bloody thing and the BBC commissioner, uh, you know. And, and but it, it really helped. For, I think I've worked on series before where everyone's a little bit, um, are selfish about their own cut and it's a bit suspicious and there's, it's quite competitive but um on Iraq it was definitely it was we I think we all worked really hard and especially with Simon who'd been on it for weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks to just kind of be really gracious to each other and share the material and mm. ping it between sweets and I mean I'm definitely doing that in the series I'm working on now where I'm working with Justin actually but I, I, I think it's something that doesn't really get talked about very much and I, I just from my career I, I know that it, it really helps to foster you know it, it, it's so easy to sort of get worried and sort of try and cling on to your own little island and um, but but really when you when you can appreciate everyone else's work, it just makes the whole thing better. And I, I think that's one of the joys that you do get from working on a series, sort of yeah. more, better and more. <laughs> yeah. Do you have any tips for um for how to protect? I can see people applauding. Um, <laughs> how do you protect it? How do you protect a scene from the commissioning editors? <laughs> <laughs> Justin, did you um did you like well wave, wave a fist about or yeah, but you don't wave it in their face, that's all. You, <laughs> you do it quietly in the, in those little meetings at the beginning of the day. No, I think it's 
in the end, it's just, it's what works, you know, in the end, it's what works will always win, I think. Yeah. You, it's, you've just got to keep pushing away at it and, and hold your ground. So there's no real magic technique, is there? There's just a, you know, you, you all come to it together and it's the team. I think what Anna's talking about is absolutely right. It's, it's how the team work together. And, and, and that goes from that if you've got good execs, they will fight your corner, you know, and I mean, good execs in the company, if you're in a production company. And I think <laughs> that communication and that trust that, that you can come as a unified block rather than sort of, you know, different agendas. When it always goes wrong when everyone's got different, different battles to fight, I think. That's okay. Awesome. I want to check, um, Roberta. I, I haven't been able to keep an eye on the the chat. Is there any? Are there any questions from anyone that we need to, to that we should include? Or we have one question so far. There's been quite a bit of chat. Uh, but question one. Uh, so it's from Stuart Davis. He says it feels to me like the series all share a quality of real insight into the human condition, and with oh, hang on. Uh, uh, it just moved. And with the possible exception of Iraq, focus on monstrous characters and their place in the world, although the monstrosities at the heart of Iraq are enormous. Do the editors feel that these are timeless stories or is there something about the populism movements and the mood of the world that makes them especially pertinent now? Mm. I, I would say that it's it's something that's been happening for a while. And now we've just seen, in my, in my opinion, we just seen the aftermath or the sort of the big eruption of it all sort of in front of our faces, you know? I think um, populism is just, um, I think it's just perhaps a, a response to everything that's been happening, you know? Um, um, I don't know what the others would say, but I think it's interesting how this sort of in the case of Rupert Murdoch, this push for um, a world, a world for his rules, defined by his set of rules, um, has actually shaped populism in 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 a very sort of sharp way, you know. Uh, and so, and it, it it sort of dominates. It dominates. And sort of, we had a contributor in episode three that Fox News not only um, it heats up the debate in a way that. He, you know, Rupert Meadow and his sort of form of news, not just creates a debate, it sort of forces the heat of the debate, which is quite, not only has a very set opinion, but it just heats it up in a really kind of obscure way. And I think, you know, his, his, his form of news outlet, it's, it's, it has helped shape that populism, you know. I mean, the Sun newspaper is not as strong as it used to be, but you know the Daily Mail is 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 equally hell bent in in heating up the debate in a way that Fox News does in the United States. You know, and there's pol everything's polarized these days. It feels but everything is polarized. Yeah, everything. I mean, you would hope, right, when you're working on pieces like this, that it is timeless in that it cha it change it, it it you know enacts some kind of a change, right? Like you know, these are all pieces that offer an immense insight into the human condition, you know, and I think that what we have is the ability to learn from that, you know, and I do have a cat in my lap now. She would start crying if I didn't bring her. <laughs> but, um, you know, and I think that that's, I, that's what I hope is timeless, you know, about, about these pieces. Not that it's timeless in that we can always, you know, we always have figures like this popping up and, you know, we can always relate to this type of shit, but but in that, um, you know, we we have the ability to now know more about the human condition, and because of that, make changes and you know recognize things now before they happen, as opposed to ten years later when, you know, in the case of Bundy or or Epstein or any of these situations, you know, people have died and and lives have been changed uh, ir irreconcilably irreconcilably for the, for the worst so that would be my hope for sure that's what keeps me going every day like when you're in the edit and it feels so difficult or the footage is traumatizing or the stories themselves you know undo a part of you that that you're contributing to change that matters for me well said mm -hmm. hey, uh, i think it's about it's also about giving 
people a voice, isn't it? You know, I think that's yeah. a voice against, and that's the thing all these films have in, in common. It's it's not just, it's not giving a platform to these people who abuse power. <laughs> it's it's the platform to the people who are abused by that mm -hmm. or are victims of, of the system that they help, help to um, promote. Yeah. And that's why I think Tiger King was in a, in a delicious spot in between all of that, wasn't it? Yeah, I mean, with the release of Tiger King tying into that, I mean, as editors, we all felt that the show was gonna take viewers on a journey where you would really see how dark the, the underbelly of Joe Exotic was. And we were all kind of shocked the way he became a folk hero. And I think it was a bit of a 50-50 split, but you know, friends who watched the series could see that arc, but a lot of people just took that surface level. Oh my God, this guy's a rebel, I'm gonna, join on to his message. And that was a, it was a shock with the release, actually. Yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah, I don't want to veer into politics, but I could imagine that there might be two communities of opinion with and good old Joe. Yeah. Are there any more questions, Robbie? Yeah, we have quite a few now. Suddenly everybody woke up. Yes. <laughs> well, I feel like jumping to, can we please see the kitty? <laughs> oh! <laughs> This is Riley. She's 18 and she just had a stroke. Oh. So oh, she, um, yeah, she's, we're just keeping a close eye on her these days. It's good that we get to be at home. So uh, we can just make sure she doesn't yeah. do anything crazy. She doesn't know she can't jump up onto the table anymore. So she <laughs> often wipes out. So we're just keeping an eye on her. <laughs> right then back to the actual <laughs> thing. Um, so, uh, Caroline Rowlands is asking, what happens when you can't acquire the archive that you need and what techniques do you go uh, you go for in if only contemporary footage is available? Sorry. If you can't get the archive you, you need, you call Miriam Walsh and then you get the archive you need. <laughs> <laughs> but you do a bad reconstruction. <laughs> well, you get your director to do. Just go to a drone shot. Always just a drone shot. A drone shot. <laughs> or, a, or a laptop or some graphic. Graphics. 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 Yeah, graphics. Yeah, graphics. Um, yeah. Uh, it's definitely a challenge. Uh, I mean, that's the, if you're doing a historical show and you don't have archive, that's the most frustrating thing for an editor. And uh, if it, luckily, I've been lucky in the last few series that they've had the budget for it and the archive producers have been incredible. Uh, that makes the show. I mean, and the researchers too, like with Bundy, we had every police record, like a binder, like that big, like hundreds and hundreds of them. You, at times you felt like a detective working, trying to solve the case. Um, it can be a burden, but it can, but if used the right way and given enough time to utilize it properly, it can, you know, be so powerful. Um, so, I mean, there's ways to, to buy stock footage and use it. Uh, it's not always ideal, but there, you know, that's, that's the Band-Aid solution is just, you know, you don't want stock footage, but if you are doing a thing and you're talking about, like in Hip Hop Evolution, it was a lot of like, we're talking about the Bronx in the 70s. So we got a lot of stock footage of what it looked like in the 70s. And you're trying to, through that, you're creating uh, an atmosphere. And I, I like to let shots breathe you know, if you're creating a time and a place, you know, often it's a news report with a, a news announcer talking over it, but you take the shot and you put in some sound effects of a subway system and all of a sudden you're in New York in the 70s. Yeah. So it can be very effective. You can do a lot with a little if you're... Yeah. With it, it. It's also finding the shots that speak to you that might not be the obvious one, you know, for, for what, just the quirky things that like a photographer would pick up details on a street and it, it's looking for those like the less, you don't want just sort of generic New York subway shots with yeah. like wide shot, but it's the person doing this funny thing with the hand or the yes. six set or the, yeah. and it, it, and that can also contribute to your own sort of style. I don't know, it's a, it's a, it's a way of looking, isn't it? And listening as well. Yeah. Yeah. Um, also, I'm currently uh, I'm currently working on a documentary about Carlos Ghosn, a feature doc, the Nissan CEO who was arrested in Japan and then escaped, and and he tells his own story and he's and this quiet. Who, who, who did you say it was, Sam? Carlos Ghosn. He's a former Nissan 
Oh, yes, no, yes. And, and Renault, and he got he gets arrested in Japan, and there's a big chunk of his life in which he's not photographed or filmed, and so so we're doing exactly what um, Steve said, which is creating stock footage, but um, but making it sort of quite quirky, so that we speed up through the part of his life where he's not there's hardly any stills of him, um, etc. So um, we just find ways of sort of cutting it quicker, but also moving away from the bits where he's not, where there's no actual archive of those, but you still need to tell it, so. There's yeah. this one sequence actually in the, the Bundy doc that I want to speak to, which was, you know, you can sort of tell, and maybe I'm wrong about this, but they were stock, maybe photographs or something, um, but you guys did this amazing thing. It was like this, you know, sort of zoom in, and then you were in the new location, and then zoom in, and you were in the new right. location, you know? Yeah. That yeah. was so effective. I love that. That was like um, yeah, yeah. really effective. Yeah, I mean, so, that, uh, that's also where graphics department can really bring yeah. the life. And you just have a bunch of boring stills. Yeah. I mean, Scott Elation, my other series, we did that a lot. And it was really effective. Um, yeah, just taking like stills, you know, they're not moving and, you know, but the, you can bring them to life. And that was, that was really a, the, a graphics department. We had sort of, us being the editors had had a you know an idea for certain sequences and then we would hand it off to the graphics department and see what they can do with it. Yeah, creating a little yeah. movement, like you know, creating yeah. a dialogue, dialogue yeah. between something that might not have a dialogue when it's just kind of sitting in your bins. You know. Yeah. 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 That's awesome. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Definitely. Um, next question from Jeremy Crichton. How did you get to a point in your career to make the step up to editor? Uh, and what are your top tips for aspiring documentary editors? Anyone? <laughs> uh, no, no. Uh, I, I was sort of lucky. I, I just started at uh, uh, working for Much Music, which is Canada's version of MTV as an editor. Um, and kind of just work my way through. I, I, I never was an assistant, actually. I kind of wish I had been because I would have learned a lot, but I've just kind of fell into it, um, worked my way up. Uh, and I guess, I know that's a frustrating thing to hear. It's like, how do you break in? But if you're assisting, uh, just always offer to cut things that they need, extra material, stuff for the web, um, anything like that. And if you're if, if you're with good editors, they should recognize your talents and, and you know, try to help you. Yeah. Uh, otherwise, just watching a ton of documentaries. I mean, I, I love documentaries. If I'm watching anything, it's mainly that. Um, I mean, I love all film, but just knowing uh, what's current and what's happening and watching a lot of docs, I think that's uh -huh. that my advice. Um, I would say for, for those of us based in Britain, um, I found myself, I like Steve was not an assistant and I was very lucky at the time I, I started working on television because they were allowing us to do Avid online. So I was working on a production company that needed to do quite fast and around food programs. And, uh, and, and, and I was very young, so I was doing online offlines and, and, and having to cut quite quick. And then when I found that I was a bit stuck and I wasn't getting a, a better quality of work in inverted commas. I, I started work. I, I went and started working in Wales and Glasgow, and that that provided me with a window to 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 you know you know more long form documentaries and and then eventually build up my CV and came back. I I think this. I don't know how it works now because it seems like a lifetime ago. But I would say that there will be hunger for editors in Glasgow, in, 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 in Belfast, in Northern Ireland, in Cardiff. So just, if you feel a bit stuck, try and, and, and send your CV there, you know? Um, I, I don't wanna, it, it's sort of, the world is, is probably, you may not even need to go to Glasgow because you, know, you may just be able to work remotely now. But, but I do think that, 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 and like Steve said, watch a lot of docs, um, f find out about the editor's names, to get in touch with them i i've had people to come and shadow me and be with me in the room and then one way or another i've been able to give them a season editor kicks and then they're now cutting you know um so i would i would you know i would say that yeah find out about watch a lot of docs find out the editor's name and just try to get in touch you know 
I, I would always welcome, like today I had someone who's a runner here who is quite clean. I, you know, you see he's just got this park and he's just going to come in early tomorrow. I'm coming in early and he's going to come in early with me before he starts his shift. And, and if I can help him out in the future, I, I definitely will, you know. Um, that's That's one way of doing it, you know. Thanks, Sam. Um, we have more questions. Okay. Um, so Rapid um, questions, Robbie, I'd say, are they? Yeah. So, and there's like a four or five. Um, so, I think this is a classic question from Andrew and Lena chipped in. Uh, music in docs, yes or no? But not only yes or no, composer <laughs> or library? Yes, but not, not. Yeah, go on, Anna. Go on, Maria. No, no, no. I was just going to say, you know, there's sort of, I think, two different ways of, I mean, you know, there are many different ways of dealing with music and docs, but I think that, you know, wall to wall music and anything, unless you're dealing with a music video, is just a bad, that's my personal opinion. It's just a bad idea. You know, you want moments to breathe, you want scenes to ha take up their own space without the music dictating uh, what a scene should do. My own personal peeve actually in narrative and documentary is when music tells me what to feel. You know, if the scene mm. itself or if the dialogue or the, you know, whatever it might be, the interview, um, the editing is not making me feel something, then I, I'm, you know, strongly opposed to the music forcing me to feel it. So that would be my note on music. Yeah, I, I completely agree with that. And any time you're trying to do that, I think you're in trouble. <laughs> yeah. I mean, the, there's a really good rule of thumb. Somebody mentioned to me and I still use it. It's like always bring the music in. If you want emotion, it's got to highlight that emotion. So if you're in a scene and someone starts crying, you don't bring the music in before they start crying. You wait until the scene gives you the cue to then allow that and that, and it should just heighten it. And I'm absolutely, I completely agree. I think less is more with music always. I yeah, and, and I'll add to that, I totally agree. <laughs> like, adding to that, like knowing when to take the music out at the right moment, like, mm -hmm. You want to maybe take music out right before someone cries and just have it silence and like the awkwardness of no music can be so powerful you know yeah. or the like silence can be so powerful you know so si knowing when to bring it in and out is just key and when to use sound design as well and sound yeah. effects. i know you mentioned it steve but i think that's really overlooked and a lot of i find a lot of people, we pay, we're so visually biased. We pay so yeah. much attention to the visuals and there's not that same understanding generally I find in the industry about sound. Sometimes you work with great directors and they really get it. But I, I think really think about so, how much, whether you can just do this without music, but just use effects instead. Yeah, I, I, have, to, I have to say, I have a very nervous disposition and insecurity. So I tend to sort of, put far too much music i'm sorry justin <laughs> and then and then and then and then i'm i'm sort of and then what i time to do if um if i have the time is to then start stripping it down start stripping it down and there's a danger with that because your executive producers your directors will get used to the rhythm of having a lot of music and i'm sort of retraining myself a hell of a lot at doing more much more sound design if i can and and dropping music and allowing the music to sort of come in when it's needed and actually um, so the problem is that if you do in my experience if you end up putting too much music at the beginning it's just gonna end up it's just gonna end up making everyone watching feel that the watch is much slower once you take it out so i'm slowly but surely trying to cope with my insecurities <laughs> and have less music from the start really because i think less is more I want to call out actually one of our editors who's here, James Steelman. Um, James, give a wave. Hey, James. There he is. Um, you know, we were always sort of working against the gun on this project. It was, you know, speed became really the name of the game at the end of the day. And um, I would often shoot my sequences over to James because he was so just so proficient at sound design and music. He always has his ear to the music. And so just a shout out to James, who was really able mm -hmm. to throw on this project in that way. Yeah. yeah. I would say work with composers rather than library. Yeah, definitely, definitely, definitely. If you yeah. can. Yeah. And yeah. I love working. I think this really overlooked. I think we have a real report. I think the sort of craft, so DPs, editors, composers, we have a real relationship. And it's really worth getting a composer in really early and just talking to them, 
yourself and sharing I love it it's one of my favorite um yeah, I love I love working with composers yeah. yeah that was one of the best parts of Tiger King going back and forth with our composer to figure out how we could give each character a distinct sort of theme and instrumentation sound because you're juggling so many different characters that music was actually really helpful and just subconsciously letting the audience know we were shifting to a different place. Um, more? Is that okay to say, I, I'm realizing that we're running over quite a bit. If you're happy to stay, I'll go on. We've got another three or four questions. Five, one just popped up. Um, just shout if you have to leave, basically. <laughs> I think I just need a toilet break. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> <laughs> oh. yeah, let's, try and, let's try and wrap it up in five minutes. Okay. Uh, Robbie, yeah. I think. Okay. okay. Yeah. Uh, oh, God. Now I need to choose, maybe. Um, so one question is about having hundreds of hours of rushes and how do you organize your material? We can answer anybody. <laughs> No, you don't organize your material. <laughs> I, I do, I do, yeah. I, yeah. It's all personal. It's all very personal, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. yeah. It's very personal, yeah. I mean, I can say one thing I do with the uh, interview selects is I like to put down my favorite selects on a timeline with just a title in front of each clip, giving me the gist of what it's about so that when I'm like, oh, where's that thing that so-and-so said? Like, where is it? Instead of rushing to a transcript, I'll just go to the timeline where I know all the best stuff is and go to each title tool and just quickly find it that way. Um, obviously, script sync is invaluable if you're using Avid. Um, that's a, like for in terms of interviews. And then with archive, I mean, you really need good assistance. You got to rely on your assistants to dig and find stuff for you and present it clearly. But yeah. I mean, it's very a personal thing. I'm curious how all you guys do it. Yeah, I like using markers or locators and putting them the little words and then seeing them in a script down. Yeah. And, and, and even just the writing down kind of seals it in my memory, but I'm always going back and finding them, making different colors, the so different colors for like cutaways or sync or my favorite bits. I'm a big, I'm a big fan of that. Mm. Me too. I like markers. I like markers, I think because I just, um, started editing a long time ago and it was before um what's it called like the the sync apps like you know i started editing when we had to sync we had to sync all of our footage with our our yeah. audio and so i didn't sort of come up working in timelines i came up working in clips and so i prefer um markers as well i prefer going my bins and then finding my markers yeah. <laughs> right i Ne next one and maybe last one but i find that quite interesting uh chris is asking um are there ever times where you personally disagree with the point of view of the documentary and must stay impartial if so how do you approach the edit in that case <laughs> always agree i bet <laughs> yeah i'm joking does a documentary have a point of view that's that's the question mm -hmm. Well, I guess also, I think is in line of what you said about uh, giving voice to the victims. Maybe, you know, obviously you're taking the side of the victim at that point. I mean, it's an obvious side to take, but you know, if you're uh, I mean, to, it's not that obvious, is it? I get into fights sometimes. <laughs> I, I think everyone on my team can agree that I am a very vocal editor. And if I don't agree with something, I say it. I think that being collaborative really requires communication. It's not about, um, for me, any one person winning. It's about listening and being able to communicate your point of view. And if you, you know, can reach uh, some kind of compromise, I guess, at the end of the day, then for me, that's really the way to work it, you know. But it's definitely about about speaking, you know, talking about what you feel is is right and what's wrong, so that at least at the end of the day, I can. I can sleep knowing I've done my best, you know, I've never, yeah, so that's where I'll leave it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, all, I think all documentaries are, they're not unbiased. Everyone has a, they're all coming with a point of view. I think you know, we're not the impartial journalist. I don't even know if that exists. Like, so it's up to you to really keep the truth and be, do justice to the, the story as best you can. 
uh, it's a tricky line. Like you can get people to say things they didn't say, and but it's up to you at the end of the day to to hold your kind of ethical storytelling intact. Oh, yeah. I think, it's, I think my rule of thumb is always to kind of represent people fairly, you know, like according to how they present themselves in interview. And I, I tend to err on presenting them better. So even if they're a monster, you know, I made a film about Ratko Mladic and we got a lot of stick because we presented the defense and made them quite likable. But I think it's really important to humanize people. How, you know, I, because I don't think that detracts from the awful things they do. I, I think it's yeah. actually part of the complexity of the world you live in. I, 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 I couldn't agree. I couldn't agree with you more. I mean, I think there's always going to be sort of a word of attrition about what you would like to be in the final car. Not a word of attrition, because sometimes it's, 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 there's not such thing as a word of attrition, but um, you need to try to sort of n never misrepresent the truth, you know? Um, you, I think it's, it's important as an editor to be able to enhance and enhance the drama of, of the truth, but not misrepresent it in a weird, strange way, never. So feel confident and comfortable that you haven't stitched up your contributors. So, um, and if they sort of, and you haven't sort of made a mockery of them or ridiculized them, you just have a certain duty of care. And I, I completely agree with you, Anna, about humanity. We, with, with the Assad series of Bashar al-Assad, when he finally realizes he's gonna become the leader of Syria, I wanted again, to treat that sequence like a bit of a tragedy where he's trying to sort of like come to terms with the fact that he's inheriting his you know the throne of that he of, of the presidency that his father has created and up, up until then he hasn't done anything wrong and after that of course <laughs> I'm, gonna, I'm gonna um i'm gonna jump in here now because what, what we normally do here is we can always we can always stay on and have a chat afterwards which lots and lots of people do um, but also, um, it's nice to be able to give people permission to, to finish up. And for some people across the water, they need to continue with their day. And for some people over here, they want to continue with their evening. So um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna just going to go through just formally wrapping things up. But everyone is welcome to stay on for a chat afterwards. And what we usually do is we unmute ourselves and activate our cameras um, so that um, yeah, we can have a, a bit of a chat afterwards and a, um, a comfort break or what have you before that, perhaps. Um, but I want to just say, um, I want to say thank you to everybody for coming along this evening, um, to the five fabulous editors, to Maria and to Anna and to Steve and to Dylan and to Sam and to, to James and to Justin and to Alvin and to the other the other people who are associated. <laughs> And who, who are we going to call if we need archive? Miriam <laughs> Walsh. Miriam Walsh. Miriam Walsh. Yeah. Walsh. <laughs> kill us. Can we just quickly, uh, I wanted to list like all the nominees, uh, just because, you know, to a reminder that this is a panel for some awards and you've all been nominated. And just to give a shout to all the other uh, names uh, of the editors of your teams, if I can. Try to do it as quickly as possible because people is voting just as a reminder go on the website and vote uh, members of bfe um but the nominee the old full list of nominees is for tiger king we have doug abel nicholas biagetti dylan hansel flinder who is here with us uh, daniel kohler i hope i'm saying the names right but anyway <laughs> jeffrey richmond then we have for the rise of Marduk dynasty, we have Justin Badger, who's here, William Grayburn and Samuel Santana, who's here with us as well. For Ted Bundy, um, we have Alvin Campana, Peter Danes, Geoff Mattinson, Eamon O'Connor and Steve Taylor. For Jeffrey Hepstein, we have Maria Cataldo, who's here, Sai Christensen, Marion Delarge, Emmanuel Nomikos, Joshua Pearson and James Stillman. And for Once Upon a Time in Iraq, we have Anna Price, Simon Sykes, Mike Davy, and William Grayburn. It's a lot of you <laughs> to take <laughs> time, but congratulations everybody for the nomination and good luck for the awards. Thank you. Thank you to all of you guys. Thank you. Yeah. 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 Fantastic. Thanks, everyone. Good luck. What's a wrap? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you.
whoever wants to stay, we got more wine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Here's to, to Simon Sykes again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. you like that. Yeah, yeah. You like that. Yeah, yeah. You'll definitely like to that. To Will Greyburn. Yeah, you know, and Will. Yeah. I know Will's been well, nominated in Will two. Will's on both. Mm. Will's in two categories, yes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, there was a nice thing last night, our Monday night, we had did an event with the drama editors and they shared what they did to kind of, um, to help get the creative juices going or, you know, if you get stuck or what have you. And one of the editors said, well, she finds if she has a shower because she's been cutting at home that, you know, and, and a lot of the time I'll have ideas in the shower as well. And then one of the other, ed another editor, Nathan, Nathan Nugent, Nugent, who did Normal People, he said he stacks, he stacks his rushes up on the timeline um, with the audio and the picture in a sort of random and a bit of a mess. And he just plays it and then eliminates some sound here, eliminates something there and finds what he likes and sometimes gets happy accidents. And um, He's actually here, Nathan. I saw him. Oh, I don't know if he can unmute himself. He's, I can see him He's still here. What made me laugh was his co-editor Stephen said that when he comes into the room, it looks like um, it's been burglarized when you see when you see, when you see Nathan's timeline. Um, hi, but, sorry, yeah, I'm, I'm here is. That on, but yeah, yeah, that's uh, you've described it pretty well there. <laughs> <laughs> really, not something I, I'd recommend to any other uh, aspiring editors. <laughs> but uh, it seems to do the job for me sometimes. <laughs> Yeah, so if, if I was to ask you guys any other question, it would be, do, do, do you have any any techniques or tricks for getting, you know, for prompting happy accidents maybe in the edit or um, when you get stuck? Uh, I tend to exercise. If I don't exercise, um, it, it sort of, I need to sort of, yeah, I tend to exercise. I have to say I struggled a hell of a lot uh, working at home in the summer and in the in, in last spring because, I need the I need the distance from home to the edit. Just listening to a piece of music, watching a documentary on my commute, you know, on the tube helps. Things that I may not have time to watch at home, other people's work, etc. I, I think that just helps, you know. And also, like sometimes just putting your your music on shuffle, you know, and some music piece of music comes up, and you just go, wow, yeah, that, that's gonna help, you know. Um, yeah, distance between the edit suite and, and home helps me and then exercise because yes. I have exercise and then I have a huge rush of endorphins and I go, aha! Uh -huh. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> that's actually been one of the perks of working at home for me because I have a treadmill here so I can hop ah. on the treadmill to exercise <laughs> if I need to break. <laughs> or, uh, sometimes I'll cook a meal because just like cooking and stepping away from the computer uh, is uh, a yeah. nice mental break or taking a walk. <laughs> Yeah, but two of you have got treadmills. That's that's interesting. I've got a treadmill too. Yeah, no, three of you. Wow, yeah. <laughs> this is the new stand-up desk, I think. Moment. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's um, yeah. Yeah. at the front and just like kind of run. run no, the okay. That's a good point. Actually. Everyone, please meet my director, Nick Green. He's actually. Oh no. He's he's built filming uh, our drama reconstruction all oh, the way to, in South Africa. Hello guys. Hi. 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 All. Yeah. All editors. All editors. Oh no, it's all. a nightmare of editors. <laughs> <laughs> nice to see you all. Nice to see you all. Nice to see you later. Have a great night. <laughs> oh, Gloris, is that our new collective pronoun or whatever? A I nightmare was, of editors. Nightmare of editors. <laughs> Um, it used to say a godsend of editors. It used to be a moan. Yeah. <laughs> um, there's one thing I would like to say. I, I can see quite a lot of um, Spanish names here. And so um, I'm looking for an assistant editor in uh, for July. So if there's anyone would like to sort of, I'm just going to put my email address. Portuguese or Spanish speaking editors or um, familiar with Spanish, I'm going to need an assistant editor who's, who can understand uh, Spanish and Portuguese. So I'm going to put my email if anyone would like to get in touch. Okay. Cool. <laughs> great. I mean, the, the, the great thing, Sam, is um, you're all now part of the, the BFE family, as it were. And um, okay. so I hope that you, you'll keep in touch and kind of use the organization. And Love to. Contact Kirsty 
if you are looking for somebody and she can put a shout out for people okay. as well. I'll, I'll, um, I'll do that as well. It's a big, um, it's a really important thing, I think, um, in terms of br bringing on assistance. It, that was yeah. one of the questions that was asked actually in the feed. Yeah. So it's, it's great to hear that you work with them. I love working with assistants as yeah, well. I'd love that. Um, yeah. I, I, I try and make a point of it um, for my jobs um, because how the hell is anyone supposed to learn? Yeah. 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 As, yeah, as, I, long, as, yeah. as long as you don't walk your dogs on the treadmill. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Very important. Well, like people, you have three months to learn Spanish and Portuguese. <laughs> <laughs> Get on with it. Go and learn your Spanish. <laughs> I just wanted to um, chip in and say, in terms of collective groups of editors, I've just been texting the very, very lovely and very, very brilliant Miriam Walsh, and she just um, texted back saying, um, "A room full of a Zoom room full of editors. How lovely! Um, imagine all that." And I just thought that was worth sharing. She's a she's a star and a love. And a... Amazing, lovely, lovely. Thank you. <laughs> the star is born. Uh, for, I have a question for you. How did you find all the nominees? What, what's the process with the BFE? Well, you know what? I forgot to say thank you so much to Robbie and and to Kirsty because. It, it was it was it was them who tracked everybody down, but the, the missing piece in the puzzle was the Tiger King crew. I yeah. thought I was I thought I was going to have to show up as Joe Exotic, you know. Um, <laughs> 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 I love to see that. <laughs> I said exactly the same. <laughs> uh, yeah, actually, it was a uh, some some guests we had already had as guests actually mostly from the drama section so that was an easy one to just really get them back on the virtual glass of wine but bonnie did a lot of the work and andrew as well i think so it was like a bit of a collecting collective get collecting the pieces together and how do you select the nominees i'm like i'm used to and there's a few awards editing there's like a, we have in canada the canadian cinema editors which is very similar to the bfe's but you submit your work or people submit it on your behalf. So how does it work with the BFE? There was, um, shall, I, shall I do this one, Robbie, or do you? Sure, I'll go for it. Um, so basically a couple of the um, governors actually set up, this is the first time we've had the awards, Steve. Okay. So, so what we did was we, we on, the web, on the website, we, we tried to generate a long list of eligible films from mm. 2020. So people, people suggested the uh, the films or the series that were eligible in the long list okay. and then it was then it was open to our members to um to choose a number of, a number of films they wanted to nominate i don't know if it was five or what mm -hmm. how many, and so you guys you guys were the top five in your category your okay. series um and that's how we got there we've got two two other really amazing awards we're doing um we have an assistant of the year award which is named oh, wow. after um one of our former members michael johns who died last year okay. and he, he was very much in favor of you know helping assistants and younger editors and then we have a breakthrough editor award named after chris crockall who's another member who sadly died last year and his his career was just really coming on um when he sadly passed so um and and those two awards are actually they're selected by a jury um, people nominated them and wrote wrote a statement saying why they nominated them. But then there's um there's so I'm I'm running the Breakthrough Editor Award and there's a jury of five people that will be doing they'll be interviewing the nominator and they'll be interviewing the nominee and then as a jury that they'll, they'll be de deliberating on them and it's um so it's it's and it's trying to it, it's an effort to highlight what it is that makes a good editor um, early on in their career and what the steps are that people take that single them out um, that, that we think that they may do well in the future. Right. So um, it's um, it's exciting that, that, that it's all happening for the first time. Yeah. You, know, you guys awesome. are the, the trailblazers here now. Yeah, I'm honored to be a part of it, so thank you. Me too, very honored. It's, yeah, it's, it's nice it's, to get, it's nice. I mean, one of the advantages of streaming and different platforms is we get to meet you guys from over the pond, which is yeah, nice. yeah, yeah. No, I, know, I, know. Yeah. I feel so moved about it. Like I'm like actually like emotional about it right now. It's, it's a really beautiful thing, especially especially at this moment in time. You know, it's, yeah. it's a globally a very trying moment, and um, 
yeah, it's just, it's a, it's a real honor to be here with everyone. Yeah. Same. Yeah. <laughs> it, 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 feels, it feels like the world got smaller in the last 12 months. Yeah. Uh, it, it, it's, it's amazing to be able to connect like this, isn't it? Yeah, it is. It's yeah. Like, yeah, this wouldn't have been possible a year ago, really. And but then I, when it all opens, we can all go and visit each other. Yes. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> Hopefully one day. See her in Soho. Then yeah. fly to Molinaire from Tottenham. Yeah. <laughs> You guys should start booking your auditorium for the in-person event because I'd like to book my tickets. I want to know yeah. if we get to see everyone here. Yeah. Next, Next year. Well, <laughs> well, you know, so on March 6th, we're going to have an awards ceremony. And um, am I shouting, by the way? I know it's a bit late. But... <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, March 6th, we're going to have an awards ceremony. And, um, you know, where, where the winners will be revealed. But then there's going to be an after party, which will be a Zoom party. Okay. And um, we actually managed to have a successful Zoom party at Christmas with various <laughs> breakout rooms. So you could you could go into whatever they were named after different people. I can't remember what themes we used, but um, it worked really well. And um, hopefully it'll be fun next Saturday when we announce who the winners are and we get to, to, to have a drink together and have a laugh together afterwards. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. I'm really looking forward to it. Win or lose. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. And it was an honor to be nominated, of course, alongside, you know, all of the other documentaries and competition. You guys have all just, you know, done extraordinary work and it's a real honor to be, to be nominated. Have you seen, have you seen the other, the other um, pieces of work? Is everybody seen there? Go on. Has everybody seen everybody's work? I'm wondering. I I wasn't able to actually watch. Uh, I wasn't able to watch uh, one day in Iraq, and I also wasn't able to watch the Rupert Murdoch doc because we don't have uh, access in our country yet. So um, I just need the links from you guys, and I felt bad asking for them last night. So I'm asking for them now. <laughs> I would love to watch. Yeah, I would love this. really love to see everyone's work. I tried. I likewise, I haven't seen uh, the ones out of the UK, and I might be the only one in the world who hasn't seen Tiger King yet, but I'm planning to. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but I have seen uh, Epstein, and I loved that. I really loved it. And I wanted to ask you, uh, I mean, you, you answered my question about you were kind of cutting it as it was happening, because I was blown away. I watched it as soon as it came out in, I think it was January, right? Was it January? Uh, Marion James helped me out. I, went yeah, yeah. out. I don't even remember. Yeah, but I mean, I couldn't believe like it. You know, the, the news. Uh, May it was Memorial Day. Yeah. Memorial Day. I it was like that. You guys must have been under such a crazy deadline to get that out. I mean, I can't imagine. Yeah, yeah, we were. Marion, yeah. do you want to like talk a little bit about it? Or I mean, it was it was nuts. <laughs> oh yeah. Steve yeah, it was, or, yeah, it was pretty nuts. Nice. It was definitely, um, uh, it was a hurry up and wait often. Yeah, a hurry up and Sorry, wait. Sorry, I'm getting some feedback or something. Um, yeah, it was a hurry up and wait. There were, there were times when we would kind of just have our heads down and be plugging away. And then other times when suddenly it would just went into overdrive. Um, yeah. and, and then something would hit the news and just, you know, it's like throwing all the papers in the air and, yeah. and seeing what lands. Um, so it was, uh, yeah, it was, it was, um, it was a process I've never been through on, on any other, <laughs> any other project for sure. It was very unique in that way. Yeah, yeah. yeah absolutely. Yeah. It was like working in a newsroom, but with the intention of making, and with obviously the process in place to make a documentary. And so, yeah, in that way, it was, it was really, and then of course, as we neared sort of the corner and we were in the home stretch, then it was just overdrive, 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 overdrive. You know, oh, and I had mentioned before um, our audience showed up that, you know, the last legitimate cutting room that I was in was the was our Epstein Filthy Rich cutting room because we we were still finishing when the pandemic hit. And so it was like, you know, I was wrapping my episode when we were kind of using hand sanitizer in the office, but didn't know what to do. And then reached the finish line, I think for me, like three days before the office shut down, we really had to, to go on, you know, go all remote at that point. So we finished all remote. Yeah. Wow. Wow. It's nuts. Yeah, my, my last day, <laughs> my, my last day on, my last day on, day on, on the day on. that New York City 
shut down. Yeah. That was, that was, yeah, it was a Monday in March and uh, there was a crazy, it was a crazy day in the office. People were freaking out. Yep. Uh, all the techs trying to fill drives up with media for all the other shows that were going remote. Yep. People coming and, in, can uh, you work from home? You know, yeah, it was from- nuts. It was, yeah. it was nuts. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Scary year. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No kidding. Rearranging. I'm curious about what the consensus is from everyone on working from home. Do people generally like it? Because I, I, I'm really in the camp of, I am a more productive editor when I work at home. I, I love working at home. I think I am too. I think I am too. I work very differently. I lo- absolutely love it at home. I, I do too. Home. I love it. Yeah. I mean, I miss <laughs> seeing people. I miss going for beers and shooting the shit after work. But I mean, I, I also have like a, two kids under four. So just to be able to pop up and see them at lunchtime and come down, it's just great. I love it. Um, but you know, I'll be, I'll be excited to get back in the edit suite for sure, but I definitely see myself advocating for at least, a, you know, 50, 50 at home and yeah. now that we know it's possible, like it just opens up possibilities. Right. Absolutely. I think it depends on the question. Yeah. I'm, I'm really miss the team. I hate, I mean, it's part of my, my home environment isn't at all. It's like Sam, it's not ideal at all. I don't have my own edit space. Um, I miss the team. I miss the banter. I miss, I, I think I'm a, colla- I'm a person who likes working in collaboration. And so yeah. I, even just that water cooler chat and popping out and just filling your head with something else. And yes. I, I find I get really energized by that. And I, I, I find it quite hard when I'm just on my own all the time. Hmm. I agree with Anna, yeah. For I, me, I, I'm, I'm, I'm with Anna. I, I mean, yeah. you know, um, I don't have, I didn't have, when I was editing at home, I didn't have a proper edit suite. So, so, uh, and so it, it just, it just didn't agree with me. And I'm, I'm, I just like being around directors and runners and I like, I like, I like l- live and that separation. Um, yeah. I just find it, it stimulating. Um, yeah. but, but you know, I mean, and so when when I, I was just trying to move my kid to the director's house as soon as I could, <laughs> you know, as soon as lockdown eased a bit. So yeah. I, I did do that. I've worked on a few projects from home since um, the lockdown. And, you know, I was working on a, this sort of a voting campaign um, about voting rights and just really trying to kind of, you know, psych up the American public to get out and vote. Um, in this election. And honestly, I mean, it was just me. It was very sort of musical. And I had a blast working from home on that piece. But then I was on a series and it was very difficult. (laughs) And um, not being able to walk into someone's cutting room, you know, and have that collaborative energy was very difficult for me. I felt, I honestly felt most of the time, like, am I dropping the ball? Like, you know what I mean? Like, am I, or, you know, because there's so many meetings and so, so much kind of um, chatter around how to do this remote thing that I felt I wasn't getting as much work done as I could have if I were in, in the room. Yeah, I miss this conversation with the director that it's just so much more efficient. You're in the room and you've got all your post-it notes, all your structure oh. on the wall. You go, how about we do this? Let's do that. Yeah, no, no. And it's yeah. just that, that creative flow you can get. It could just be much more efficient, even if it's two days a week. You know, I, I mean, maybe I'm with you that, that half the time working from home, half the time in the it, collaboratively is probably the ideal. There's, yeah. there's certain times, I mean, for me, like when I miss being in the edit suite, it's usually at the beginning when you're doing the heavy lifting and with the post-it notes on the board and you're really looking at a series wide arc and story like it, I mean that's awesome but then there's the time where you've got your your fine cutting and you just kind of want to zone out and yeah do creative stuff and put the bells and whistles on your your edit that I really like like the the flexibility of working at home on, in the hours I want you know I might be creative at 10 at night and I go mm-hmm. do it I mean the downside is that you're kind of married to your job but yeah, you know, you just have to. You have, it's up to you to come up with the balance and to set your boundaries of when you're working, when you're not. And yeah, I mean, it's, I definitely miss people. I will say that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Like even seeing my fellow editors from Filthy Rich here, I'm like, you guys. <laughs> you know, I miss. I miss that that uh-huh. really physical collaboration. Yeah. 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 I hope we'll be able to. Uh, uh, 
um, I, I hope editors will be able to choose and determine how they work. And I think we'll be consulted more on how we want to structure the edit and the projects, you know, rather than being said, okay, we're doing the post at, you know, wherever it is, you know, it, it won't be now you're going here. It's like, well, would you like to be at home for some of the time? And would you like to be yeah. here for some other time? And we, can, we can arrange that. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, I do think that, you know, uh, a lot of companies will have figured out how convenient it is when they don't have to pay for edit rooms and they can shunt off yeah. the expenses for the electricity and they don't have to pay to have the coffee machine filled and all that. So I think, you know, if someone wants to work at home, companies are going to be much more amenable in the future than they maybe used to be when they like to be able to walk in your room and make sure you're clicking away. Um, <laughs> but uh but the thing is, is that the problem is that the avids are kind of a fixed cost. And if they have them, they have them. And it, there still might be a little bit of a tussle to figure out how they can um, how they can feel OK about having to pay for the machines to be there sometimes, but you're not always using it. Um, you know, I, maybe if you're remoting in, that that solves that problem. Um, but um, but if you're working off your own system, I think it's still going to be a little bit of a, a little bit of a back and forth for them to to justify the cost of a machine that's just sitting there some days. Yeah. yeah. Isn't isn't the shock that they didn't figure that out before? <laughs> they didn't have to. <laughs> they didn't have to. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, well, the, the well, no. Uh, honestly, I think for a lot of people, it was a control issue. A con yeah. It's a control issue. I think they don't, you know, they don't quite know what we do. And despite the fact that it's very obvious, like if you've either got a sequence at the end of the day or you don't. Yeah. So it's very painfully obvious when you haven't gotten anywhere, right? Yeah. Um, but people, I think, really like, they like to be able to walk in the room and see your hand on the mouse and make sure you are working, especially because, you know, as editors, often you just need to stop and think a little bit. Yeah. And that makes people suspicious that you're not working, but no stuff is going on. You just can't see it, you know. Yeah. You know, I actually. Yeah. I, oh, I don't. Want I was to just going to say about if, if they're observing how you work, you know, you know that there's some observational software that can tell you know when you're you're mm -hmm. using the program and not. <laughs> I I think if I was obser being observed, I wouldn't feel as happy or comfortable about it at all. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I'd, I'd rather be trusted, basically. Um, we, we used to have a facility in the BBC in, in, in the, the Bristol um, site, and I forget what the chat function was called, but one of the settings on it you could check was pro block others from seeing that I am idle. And you think, like, yeah, in life. <laughs> <laughs> I, love that. I love that in life, yes. <laughs> what, 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 what's the, big, the big Hollywood producers who walk past the writer's room, and if he didn't hear clacking of typewriters, he got really pissed off. Mm -hmm. So yeah. I, I I do my best thinking editorially when I'm walking with my dogs. Yeah, I, I I totally agree. Like going for a walk, you're still solving problem solving. I mean, I I'm sure you can all relate. I I wake up having dreams about problems in the edit. You know, I think about it's like in your. I go to sleep with it, so it's like you, you almost can never turn it off. Really, no, you can't. Yeah. yeah. It's all consuming. You wake up at 4 a.m. thinking, oh, write that down. Yeah, yeah. I dream in edits. Anyone else dream in edits? You, oh, I can reclaim oh, my the time. different angles and like, oh, okay. yeah. Marking in, marking in, marking in. Last night, last night it was like the science fiction plot that I couldn't wait to get back into. And I was like, oh, give me the other angle, give me the other angle. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I'm always trying to undo when I'm dreaming. Yeah. I once had a dream when I first started editing. This was, oh, this is actually the worst uh, ones are when I'm, I'm trying to make the same cut. Yeah. No, I'm just saying so the, when I'm really stressed out, I have that one where I'm trying to get the, make make the same cut over and over and over again, and I can't get it to work. Yeah. It's uh, it gives me no rest whatsoever. <laughs> okay, someone should roll this down and send it to me so I can print it in the magazine. <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted to say, guys, I'm going to now love you all and leave yeah, you. Yeah, I'm going to do so very much. Uh, it's amazing, amazing. Good amazing. Good Thank you, everyone, to be a fee for all. Thank you, Sam. Thank, Thank you, Sam. So Thanks, Sam. Thank, Thank you. you. Lovely to meet you all. Thank you. Really nice yeah. to meet you. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, Anna and Maria. Thank you so much. Yes. Thank, Thank you, everyone. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye. 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 Bye
Bye. Bye.